Welcome back in to the early line. It is hour number two right here on Sports Grid. Kevin Walsh, Donnie Wright side, taking a look at some more NFL headlines. We talked Jimmy Garoppolo in hour number one. I want to make the move over to the tight end position, specifically in Vegas. Darren Waller is looking for an extension, and I think with good reason. We've talked about DK Metcalf, right? DK needs to get that bag before everything falls apart with a full season of Geno or Drew Locke. Kyler Murray needs to secure that bag before he goes out there for another six games without DeAndre Hopkins in maybe still the toughest division in football, certainly at least in that NFC. You need to get your money before your circumstances change. Darren Waller might be a better example than both because entering the fold in Vegas is maybe football's best wide receiver. No worse than a top three in the sport and a guy who, despite being brand new to the organization, has maybe a better rapport than you do with Derek Carr because of their college days. Very easy to understand, Donnie, why Darren Waller is trying to press it down and look for that payday from Vegas. And he should, and rightfully so. And we talk about in the NFL where you do get guaranteed money, but you don't get guaranteed contracts. Signed his extension, which is a nice extension in 2019, but now, turns out, Kevin, the 17th highest paid tight end in football. Now, we know Darren Waller is much better than the 17th tight end overall in the NFL. And if everybody Mm -hmm. around you is getting money, as an organization, Kevin, you fully understand this as well. You know showing up to camp. And we haven't heard much squawking out of Darren Waller. Not showing up. I don't want to be a Raider. He certainly played the part and performed on the field, which is most important. So if you're going to sign a wide receiver to one of the most lucrative contracts in NFL history and a guy with, you know, Hunter Renfro in the slot that, hey, Hunter, do you want a new contract? No, I'm really happy. I'm really – no, no, no. We're going to give you a new contract because you deserve it. Oh, I guess that's okay. Like, it seemed like he plays that all shucks character here. But Darren Mm -hmm. Waller does deserve to be paid as well. You have to look at your players and also keep in mind with Carr. Usually he's going to be an advocate for all those guys. Every time you hear Derek Carr speak, it's usually very glowingly about his players. You know, this guy's a great running back. This guy's a great tight end. This guy's a great wide receiver. Let's work with it. Let's put it together here in 2022. So from my perspective here, I got to tell you, he has to get paid, and he will get paid. Can you imagine, hey, you know what? We'll, we'll work this out next year when everybody around him is signing new paychecks, including his quarterback. He's going to end up getting paid as well. It's for the good of the Raiders to do that here for the season. The interesting thing is we did hear a little bit about teams trying to call on Darren Waller. The best one, of course, was about a month after the Devontae Adams trade. The reports that were like, the Packers are interested in Darren Waller. (laughs) Were they uninterested a month ago? (laughs) Like, What what are are they doing? Again, what are they doing in Green Bay? But for Darren Waller, two seasons in a row of 1,000-plus yards, 1,100 yards. Last year, only plays 11 games, 665 receiving yards, but still caught 55 passes in those 11 games. The injury bug catches up to him a little bit there. But Hunter Renfro emerges, has his that 1,000-yard season. Here's the interesting thing, and I wanted to kind of add this to the equation to really put this into perspective for people. Devontae Adams has a season-long number now of 1,200, and Hunter Renfro has a season-long number of 775 and a half, and then Darren Waller's checks in at 875 and a half. And why I think this is relevant is you don't have a lot of teams out there with three different pass catchers all seeing season long numbers. We bring our radio audience into the mix here on the early line. Kevin Walsh, Donnie Wright, Side Sports Grid Radio, Sirius XM, Channel 159. I think the point I'm trying to make is, Donnie, this is not just a crowded pass catcher room, it's a high leverage one. Devontae paid, to your point, Renfro paid. To your point, Waller is momentarily the man left out. And that's why I think it's so important for Waller to get his. Because, again, look at that over-under. Odds are he's not going to catch 1,000 yards this year. He's probably not going to be anywhere near, you know, double-digit touchdown receptions or anything of the like. He has to be paid now or because his numbers are very likely going to take a legitimate hit. 
No, and they probably will. And also, with that graphic we look at, Devontae Adams, Waller, and Renfro, if you look at each one of those individualized and you say to yourself, Devontae Adams, 1,200, he should easily get that. Darren Waller, 875, he stays healthy, he'll blow right through that. Then you take a look at Hunter Renfro, 775, he should get through that as well. But let me tell you something here. If all three of those guys, Kevin, hit those numbers, the Raiders probably win that division, which means their offense was absolutely <laughs> unstoppable with three 1,000-yard-plus targets is probably what you have up there, which I don't think is going to be the case. So who is the actual odd man out there? Now, if you ask each one of those guys, and also Derek Carr, this is a great problem to have because it's the same way we talk about Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey where you say, if I have an elite wide receiver on the outside, that automatically takes safety help away from me, and I'm athletic enough to beat linebackers all day long. Same thing with Hunter Renfro. Hey, look at this. On third and six, are they going to double cover me in the slot, leave Devontae Adams one-on-one -on, -one on the outside? That's not happening. So you're right. From a room where everybody is happy, you can't have this, Kevin. You can't have Devontae Adams paid like an absolute monster, which he is. Hunter Renfro, again, deservedly so with the new contract, where you say, well, where's mine? Like, I want to be a team player. You pay me, and I go out here, Kevin, have 700 yards and 55 catches in a full season, and we win, and I got paid. That's a fantastic year. But you know what's not a fantastic year? Getting those statistics and not getting paid while everybody else is getting paid, and them saying, hey, Waller, be a team player, man. You're still under contract. It doesn't work like that. It certainly doesn't. Although maybe the cheat code of all those guys over unders, Derek Carr over his passing yardage prop. We'll be Ooh. right back. The morning after. So today we hit the streets of Manhattan to test New Yorkers baseball knowledge and to see how many all stars we have. Don Mattingly was a former player for the Yankees. Now a head coach of. I don't know, man. I know nothing about sports. Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers plays football, but relatively close. Jeter. Derek Jeter. Uh, Derek Jeter. Derek Jeter. Aaron Judge. Aaron Judge. Aaron Judge. Aaron Judge. Aaron Judge it is. We're in New York. They love the Yankees. The Sports Grid Network. Pharrell, coast to coast. The team I keep coming back to is the Mets. And I come back to the Mets because they are all in right now. They have two starting pitchers, one of which is the best pitcher in baseball when he's on the mound coming back and Jacob DeGrom, who might opt out of his contract. The other is Max Scherzer, who's an older pitcher. They are in right now for this season. Juan Soto, you can back up the truck with the prospects the Mets have, whether it's Alvarez, Beatty, um, Mauricio. The Sports Grid Network. Fantasy Sports Today. The Baltimore Orioles take uh, Jackson Holiday, who is a shortstop. And according to Keith Law from The Athletic, he was basically one of the guys who did the, uh, you know, improved his draft stock the most over the last 12 months. He uh, essentially, he got into the gym, reworked his body so that uh, he kind of went from more of a, a contact, even swing plane type pitch to, or a hitter to uh, like a power hitter. The Sports Grid Network. You might be the next Daily Fantasy Millionaire. No matter what you watch or where you play, learn from the world's best DFS players. Lineup building tools, expert projections, and advanced stats change the way you play the game. Dominate the competition. DailyRoto.com, the player's choice. Maurice Allen, 2015-2016 European Long Drive Tour Champion, 2017 World Number One. Me personally, I keep my game face on me all the time. Especially coming out of the bunker, leaving the range, or even leaving the course. What's your story? The early line. This actually was a positive sign from the Lakers because at least these guys are talking, trying to repair that relationship. And also, it doesn't hurt that they finally put out a positive leak on the Lakers side of this because nonstop negativity has been the tone as it pertains to Russ and L.A. Only on Sports Grid.
Baseball award season is about to ramp up, obviously, as we hit the second half. I look forward to breaking these down, anticipation, season ending, and then, of course, waiting until, what, December, Donnie? When do we, when do we, find, when do we find out when these guys win the awards next year? 2031. I think they're 10 years post-dated where we finally find out yeah. the excitement of who actually wins this. Terrible job, once again, you're right, by Major League Baseball there. Miguel Cabrera is going to be accepting his uh, Triple Crown MVP trophy uh, at some point this season for the Detroit Tigers. I got you. Here's what we want to do. We're going to start with the MVP awards. We're going to start in the American League. I'm going to. Here's how I want to start. Jordan Alvarez, thirteen to one. Trout, twenty to one. Devers, twenty-three to one. Are you entertaining the idea of any of the non-Otani Judge options in this market? No, and I just preface this by saying outside of something catastrophic happening to Otani or Judge, that's going to be 1 and 1A down the stretch. I don't see any way, shape, or form. Jordan Alvarez hit 72 home runs. Okay, you got to give it to him. But outside of anything ridiculous, this is a two-horse race coming down the stretch with Otani and Judge for me. If I were to entertain one other guy, if I were to, it would be Devers. I don't know if Alvarez or Trout. Uh, are going to have the sauce there. Devers is kind of, you know, I still think maybe creeping up on people a little bit statistically. This season is batting 324 with 22 home runs. He's got 55 RBIs, 62 runs scored. If that Boston Red Sox team continues to make a push, I think there's a world where Devers enters the mix, but I largely agree with you. I think if you're betting those numbers, because they are big numbers, small shots. You're not, you know emptying the bank account, right? To all of a sudden be loading up here on guys that are 23 to one this deep into the season. So we essentially are at the same kind of point we've been at the entire way. Otani plus 100, Aaron Judge plus 125. Where are you at this point? Because there are some people, so this is the part that I've largely disagreed with. There are Otani believers and backers who don't think this is a race. They think this is a non-conversation. The odds have never reflected that, though, Donnie. Where are you entering the second half on Otani versus Judge? Here's where I'm at. And it sometimes you have to, you know, leave open that open-ended question, Kevin, something historic out here. And let's just say Shoei Otani continues his dominance on the mound, and he's the best pitcher in the American League. You might have to take a step back to yourself and say, well, it doesn't even matter if Judge hits 55 home runs and the Yankees finish with 117, you know, let's just say wins at the end of the season. You're probably going to give it up to Otani at that point. But at the same time, when you flip it over to Aaron Judge, if he does something historic and Otani, again, has a great season, Kevin. I'm talking about an ERA 2.75 where he finishes the year and hits 40 home runs. If Aaron Judge and the Yankees do set the American League record, should I say Major League Baseball record and wins, the Yankees get the number one overall seed and Judge approaches 60 home runs, he's going to be the MVP here. So it's a great argument to have because if you're just asking alone, who is the most important player in baseball, probably the best overall, it's clearly Shohei Otani because he's a dominant pitcher on the mound and a quality hitter at the plate. This is something we never see in Major League Baseball. Mm-hmm. But we do know there's a voting block out there, and rightfully so, public perception. We just gave it to Otani last year. He didn't have quite the season he had the year before, even though what he's doing is still MVP material. We want to give it to somebody else. But you can't just give it to somebody else if the Yankees stumble down the stretch and the Astros end up with the number one overall seed and Aaron Judge hits 47 home runs. Even though he led the league in home runs, which he might do at 47, and the Yankees are still a really good baseball team, that's fine. And the Angels aren't a very good baseball team. You still end up giving it to Shohei Otani. Somebody, Kevin, has to do something historic in the second half, and that's going to be enough to put them over the top. What becomes interesting, though, and I think you're right, we talk about history, is does the potential for Yankee history, team success, factor into this conversation at all? Obviously, the uniqueness of Otani is really impossible to match when he is on his game. The one thing that... I, I know people like to pretend that Otani the entire season was the Cy Young and, and mashing like he was last year. That isn't true. Where this turned is Otani legitimately entered the Cy Young race. When we talk AL Cy Young, we are going to talk Otani. That is where this all started 
to flip around. I wonder what happens if Otani does a level off as a pitcher. I'm not saying I have any reason to believe that does happen. It's just the fact that Otani has been so much better than the pitcher that he was, not just to begin the year, but even compared to last year's numbers. That ERA last year was a touch above a three. This year, you're under a 2.4. The whip is under a one. The Ks per nine goes up you know, 2.5 from compared to last year's. That is where this has all started to turn for me. I wonder if not only does Judge Donnie need those 55, 60 home run numbers, but does he need the Yankees to win 110 baseball games? Is that what you're all of a sudden needing to edge out Otani? Or for some people, does that not matter? Is baseball so unique compared to all of these other sports when we talk MVP that team success really doesn't matter in the conversation? Take it back to high school or college, Kevin. At the end of a semester here, you need a little bit of extra help. What do you do? You go to the teacher. Hey, look, I'd really like to improve my grade. What can I do? How about some extra mm-hmm. credit work? And that's what we're dealing with. Not from Aaron Judge's side, right, where you're saying to yourself, hey, I control my batting average. I control the home runs I hit and how well I play in the field. But what is the extra credit that you get? The Yankees doing something special. The Yankees finishing with the top record in baseball history here. The Yankees heading down the stretch, being one of those teams where you look at and say they are the prohibitive favorite here to win the World Series. That's the extra credit you need because you need everything in your power to try to combat Shohei Otani, who can do more things than you can. So if Shohei Otani, let's get this straight right now. If the Angels were playing baseball like they were back in May and say, hey, they have a legitimate chance to make the playoffs and or challenge Mm -hmm. the Astros in that division, I don't even think we'd be talking. Otani would be a minus 350 favorite right here because that's all the boost that the, oh, look, plays on a great, great baseball player on a great baseball team. He's getting held back slightly here because of how bad the Angels are and how good the Yankees are. But that's not Aaron Judge's fault that he plays on a better team. But that extra credit is here. Hey, you know what? Let me hit 55 home runs and us get 120 wins on the season. You almost have no choice, Kevin, but to make Aaron Judge the MVP. Yeah, it becomes very, very interesting. I want to make the move to the National League. There's a lot of guys to talk about. But I want to start with what I think is one of the most interesting things about this current race. The favorite is Paul Goldschmidt. At plus 110. We know that war matters. Here's why I bring it up. (laughs) Arenado leads baseball in war, or excuse me, the National League at five. Goldschmidt's a 4.8. And Tommy Edmond, another St. Louis Cardinal at 4.4. So you just go, hold on a minute now. What is going on? Why is this all a St. Louis Cardinals list? Here is what's kind of going on. Right now, defensive war Tommy Edmond is an outrageous 2.3. And no surprise, the second best is Nolan Arenado's 1.8. Statistically, Donnie, offensive numbers, it's Goldschmidt and a monster gap between his own teammates I'm talking about. But these guys are doing, you know, on the defensive side of the baseball, which usually was never talked about too much, especially in MVP races, they've been magical. My question, and we'll break this more down next segment, Could these defensive superstars actually factor into this conversation because of how it boosts their overall wins above replacement? Like, yeah, look how far we're going down the list now. Because why? Because we have Paul Goldschmidt as the favorite here at the FanDuel Sportsbook at a plus 110. We're in a holding pattern, Kevin. When you fly over the airport, hey, we're not going to land for another 30 minutes. Oh, why not? We're waiting for somebody to overtake Paul Goldschmidt. We're waiting for Manny Machado to get hot. We're waiting for Mookie Betts to carry the Los Angeles Dodgers to 110 wins and a first-place finish here. Aren't we doing that? Is anybody right now out there watching this show going, my goodness, now's the time to strike on Paul Goldschmidt? Absolutely not, Kevin. Which means there has to be more value down this board, if that Mm -hmm. is the belief. We'll break down the NL MVP race, the Cy Young markets, and the Rookie of the Year, as well as we get ready for baseball stuff. Coast to coast. He is finished. He'll come back next year. It'll happen again, and he'll never pitch again. That'll be the end of it. I, I think that Strasburg Bills. had his he had his moment in that World Series when the Nationals won it. He gave it all out, and, and he, he had injury problems before that. 
and now he just hasn't been able to stay on the field since. Uh, it's unfortunate, but I think that he is finished. The Sports Grid Network. The morning after. The starter for the AL is Shane, Man Shane McClanahan, but maybe Shohei will pitch at a certain point, but Shohei will lead off in that spot. And it's the first pitch of the game to Shohei Otani. The betting favorite right now is a strike or a foul tip. That's even money, plus 100. But why not take a shot? Why not sprinkle that Shohei makes some contact, puts one into play? That's plus 550. Any other outcome? We're going for plus money tonight at the All-Star Game. The Sports Grid Network. Sports Grid, your 24-7 sports wagering network. They play less games. The early line. Take a look at the top four seeds here in the Big Ten. They're going to play Aaron less Rogers and The morning the after. Wilson. We saw movement in the marketplace like Orlando. Fantasy Magic. Sports the today. The Cavaliers are a little thin as well. Newswire. Minus 160 favorite on the money line today for Arizona. Pharrell coast to coast. That's where they win cups. Stanley Cups over there. Give me the game penguins. time decision. Kind of bizarre when you consider like the, everybody is out for the Warriors. In game live I all like access. Mandy. I like Vandy against Bam. I think Vandy can win the game, take a corner. In half. game oh, live man. prime oh, yeah, time. Major, the PGA champion. In yes. game live overtime. All done before the final bet. Get the game. winning edge only on Sports Grid. Maurice Allen. 2015-2016 European Long Drive Tour Champion, 2017 World Number One. Me personally, I keep my game face on me all the time. Especially coming out of the bunker, leaving the range, or even leaving the course. What's your story? Finishing out the NL MVP race. Now, we are talking about Goldschmidt. It's very interesting. He's a plus 110 number right now. Statistically, op offensively, very clearly has been the best National League hitter. Real, a legitimate gap. Offensive war, he's a 4.7. Machado is a 3.9. So that is why right now it's hard to really touch his statistical dominance. But it doesn't feel like he has the level of juice maybe that at least we hear about an Otani, right? Like, his his number's not all that different from Otani, but people speak about it so much differently in terms of, all oh, the gap that he's leaving. Look at how much closer Judge is than a Manny Machado is or the third choice there in a Mookie Betts, right? It goes to show that there is, for some reason, not that same prevailing narrative on a Goldschmidt. So maybe there is value, which begs the question, Donnie, where would it be? Who are you looking at? Machado, one of these Dodgers, your boy Austin Riley, who might have juice mm. here in the NL MVP race? I, I got to tell you, when, when you go down the list, it's it's interesting to see to me because you see the two defined leaders in the clubhouse, per se, there for the American League when you're looking at Otani and Judge. You say, yep, that makes sense. Two star guys, they'll battle it out. I don't get that feeling here for the NL, which I think it's a market that you could probably make some money off of because, as I said before the break, I don't look at Paul Goldschmidt like, you know what, that's the NL MVP. He's got it hands down. Fantastic ball player, worthy, of course, but he's not a runaway leader for me. Plus 110 to Manny Machado's plus 550 here at the FanDuel Sportsbook. It just seems to me like somebody in that second tier here. Now, if we're going all the way down, Reese Hoskins, Nick Castellanos, Jazz Chisholm, obviously C.J. Crone for the Rockies, they don't really ring a bell and say, hey, let's take a flyer on a guy like that. But I got to tell you, like Manny Machado is interesting here because what happens if they do make the trade for Juan Soto and they do end up overtaking the Los Angeles Dodgers in the NOS? That's going to be a boost. But I got to tell you, 
The guy that really just jumps right off of the page for me is the guy third in line at 10 to 1, along with Freddie Freeman, and that's Mookie Betts. It just seems like he can make those highlights, Kevin, in the outfield. He's the leadoff hitter, getting a lot of at-bats for a Dodgers team that we anticipate is going to have a fantastic record when it's all said and done, well over 100 wins. If I'm taking a flyer here, and again, it is hard to do with the Dodgers because this isn't a one-man show that says, I'm going to be the top guy here. You got Freddie Freeman in there. You got Trey Turner out here. There's so many different players that you can look at from the Dodgers, but just from that all-star perspective where everybody knows Mookie Betts is a great player. He catches fire for the second half of the season. I think at a 10-to-1 price, he can overtake a Paul Goldschmidt and also a Manny Machado. Look, Mookie Betts always is going to have fantastic numbers. I think I would be more inclined to line up, though, Freeman or Trey Turner, really, if I were looking to back somebody in a Dodger uniform. And again, it's it's this is where baseball is very different. Oh, well, what if they go out there and win 105 games? Bryce Harper won the MVP last year. They missed the playoffs. So that doesn't really matter. You can't kind of sell me on what happens if St. Louis kind of falls apart. As long as Goldschmidt goes out there and leads, you know, the National League in all these numbers, it's very likely his award. It's just there is this oddity there that the defensive metrics shine so favorably on his own teammates and specifically Nolan Arenado that could that lead to an odd conversation where if you line up the numbers that you typically would have, batting average, home runs, RBIs, OPS, it's all Goldschmidt, 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 but then I go, you know, defensive runs saved and it's Arenado, and how would that factor in? to a conversation. We move over, though, to the Cy Young race there. We might as well stick National League, and then we'll circle back to the American League side of things here. Sandy Alcantara, Corbin Burns, Joe Musgrove, Max Fried, Tony Gonsolin, Zach Wheeler. That right there, is, and Carlos Rodon, that's your front seven. All these guys that are under a 20-to-1 number right now. Well, you've got a minus price here on Sandy. The metrics all point towards him as well but are we at a point where we could confidently lay a minus number on him Donnie I don't think so just yet and I I don't want to use in the same pattern as you know we're waiting for Paul Goldschmidt to somebody overtake him Alcantara's been a sensational pitcher over the first half and quite frankly doesn't play on a great baseball team either but in a game that's so statistical here that Major League Baseball is a pitcher can only do so much Go out there and dominate. I don't know. Have an ERA below a two and keep your team in the game each and every time. And also, he probably should have been the overall starter here for the National League in the All-Star game. Was it not Mm -hmm. for Clayton Kershaw pitching in his home ballpark there? So I do agree that he should be the favorite, but he is a prohibitive favorite here. Corbin Burns, 7-1. Joe Musgrove, 14-1. Max Reed, 16-1. Those guys don't absolutely jump off the page with name recognition. It's not as if like a Jacob deGrom or a Max Scherzer that I'm going to talk about in just a few moments here. But he is deserving of that but also I say this Kevin the Marlins are under 500 they do play in the ultimate pitcher's ballpark which when you take a look at some of those analytical numbers Sandy Alcantara doesn't line up as well as some of the other guys here because he does get a lot of credit for pitching down in Florida at Lone Depot Park that is the ultimate pitcher's paradise for the most part and also you're not pitching in high leverage situations where you have 30,000 screaming fans in big market situations they don't they have several hundred fans each time that he is pitching but also I want to get at this which we talked about a little bit yesterday on the radio show in the afternoon If Sandy Alcantara struggles a little bit, I don't think he gets the benefit of the doubt, like he would say with a Verlander or a Jacob deGrom or a Max Scherz. Oh, whole bounce back there. I'm waiting for that minus 125 to turn into a plus 125 with like one bad start, three innings pitched, five earned runs, and here we go. I think Sandy Alcantara has to be sensational down the back half of the season to win this award. Not good, not great, sensational, Kevin. He has been that though every single pitcher in the national league other than sandy is above a two era a legitimate gap i know that and i'm not trying to discredit you know ex fip sierra maybe say some different things about sandy but i think donnie at least even a voter who tries to go a little bit more into the numbers right his road era is a 1.88 that would still be the best yeah. in the National League, right? But also, again, it's all these other numbers. Your adjusted pitching runs, adjusted pitching wins, adjusted ERA plus, win probability added, or just even the very baseline wins above replacement. As a matter of fact, Sandy Alcantara 
has the most wins above replacement of everybody in Major League Baseball. Yes, that includes Shohei Otani. And I think a good part of that, Donnie, is he's pitched 12 more innings than every pitcher in Major League Baseball. So that's on average for a lot of guys. That's what two extra starts he gives you, basically because of how deep he's going into baseball games, especially compared to the modern pitcher. But to your point, am I dying to lay minus 125 at the point time being? No, but I almost feel like I am running into a comparable issue here that I am with Paul Goldschmidt. Maybe I don't love Paul Goldschmidt at plus 110, but I don't know who I love. I think, though, if I were to bring one guy into the equation, it's probably Tony Gonsolin, and it's for this reason. Gonsolin, to me, is clearly the second best guy, but he's not priced like it. I understand maybe they say, listen, it's more likely that Corbin Burns is great in the second half compared to Tony Gonsolin, but that's not how it's played out. Are you surprised at all that Gonsolin and his 11-0 record, 2.02 ERA, and all these other numbers that are basically just behind Sandy isn't the second choice in the market? It's almost like facial recognition, right? Most people don't really know who Tony Gonsolin is outside of the Los Angeles market. And also, you have to factor in, does it seem like anybody that goes out to pitch for the Dodgers dominates on a night-to-night basis? I don't know what they have in the water out there or the type of pitching staff that they have, or even, should I say, the instructional pitching staff that they have, which is just lighting up guys that you can just plug and play out there as a starter. But you're right. He doesn't get a lot. And maybe there is a bump for a Dodgers pitcher that says, well, they're on a really good team in a pitcher's ballpark. They're supposed to be great pitchers. So he is an interesting one as it lines up. For me, I even look a little bit further down the line because I want bumps. We talked about it in the markets where you say, okay, do you get a bump if you're Aaron Judge if your team wins 118 games or 120 games? Do you get a bump if you're Shoei Otani if their team miraculously winds up in the wild card race? You probably do. But if you look at Max Scherzer here, at a 39-1 to price to win the NL Cy Young, he's missed quite a bit of time. But he was sensational, Kevin, before missing that time. He has been sensational after coming back from missing time. And also, this is a Mets team that no longer says, why would I make him the the Cy Young Award winner? They didn't even need him. They're up 13 and a half games without their two best pitchers. That wasn't the case. As we saw that 10 and a half dwindled down to basically a game and a half in that Atlanta series. And the reason why I bring up that Atlanta series with Max Scherzer is what? You saw Max versus Max in that series. In a big game moment, Scherzer was sensational. So maybe he gets a bump if he is tremendous. And he will have to be throughout July, August, and September to climb back into this race. But let's just say, Kevin, last two weeks of the season, I don't even look at the schedules, but maybe it lines up where the Mets are going to be playing the Atlanta Braves or playing in high leverage situations. And Max Scherzer is out there absolutely dominating on the biggest stage. He's going to get a boost. He's intriguing to me, Kevin, at a 39 to 1 price here. The interesting thing, though, on Scherzer at this point in the season is he's at 69 innings pitched. Sandy's at a buck 38. You're going to need an injury, I think, to be honest with you. Now, Scherzer, again, Scherzer, we know that we saw last year. He got traded to the Dodgers, and the, the equation changed all of a sudden, it felt like, right? But that is just such a big innings gap that I think it could be difficult for him to start to match. The other thing with Gonsolin, and this is, we we joked like Julio Rodriguez had a great home run derby and his rookie of the year odds are on the move, yeah. right? Uh, you know, you, you get that Stanton home run or do people, you know, start to bet MVP. Tony Gonsolin was obviously lit up relative to everybody else, right, in the all-star game. Is that yeah. part of the reason that his number moved back a bit? He was also kind of bad his last start before the All-Star game as well. And maybe, and yeah, I'm like half kidding here, is that part of the reason McClanahan is at plus 200 instead of that same minus 125 when McClanahan might have an even bigger gap, it feels like at times, compared to all of the American League pitchers than Sandy has over the National League. We'll button up this award conversation and get you some preview as the second half is back underway today. All coming up after this very quick break. Your heart's racing. The clock's running out. It all comes down to this. We're talking pregame. 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 
Get locked in with game time decisions. Your hosts, Gabe Marinci and Cam Stewart, will get you ready for game time. Everything you need to know before a game goes off the board with the best lips to back it up. Make your best bet with live odds updates, late breaking news, up to the minute injury reports, and real time analytics from inside the sports books. All the odds, all the action from sports wagering insiders and industry pros like Donnie Wrightside, Cam Lou, Cousin Sal, the pro football doc, Dr. David Chow, and more. Get the winning edge every weekday afternoon from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern, 3 to 4 Pacific. It's game time decisions only on Sports Grid. You might be the next daily fantasy millionaire. No matter what you watch or where you play, learn from the world's best DFS players. Lineup building tools, expert projections, and advanced stats change the way you play the game. Dominate the competition. DailyRoto.com, the player's choice. Pharrell, coast to coast. He is finished. He'll come back next year. It'll happen again, and he'll never pitch again. That'll be the end of it. I, I think that Strasburg had his, he had his moment in that World Series when the Nationals won it. He gave it all out, that, and he, he had injury problems before that. And now he just hasn't been able to stay on the field since. Uh, it's unfortunate, but I think that he is finished. The Sports Grid Network. The early line. When you watch J-Rod's opening round, you go, oh, yeah, everyone's going to get their bonus time, and it's really going to be a four-minute first round. Julio Rodriguez kind of teased a little bit there. He made it look Man. so easy. It was not that easy for almost everybody else that followed. Nobody had as big of a round one as Julio Rodriguez did. Only on Sports Grid. Right here on the early line, we do have some baseball to preview. Not a monster slate. Not everything even finalized. We will get there. But I want to hit that AL Cy Young race because, to me, there's there's two major talking points. One is, can Otani, can Otani actually do this? And the second is, why is McClanahan not a bigger favorite in the market? We'll start with the Otani conversation here, DRS. As I said, can he actually do this? I think he can do it, right? I don't know he can do it. He's talented enough, but I just don't know if he's coming from that far back here. And also the premises that you brought up before the break, which is kind of comical. You know, Gonsolin got hit around the All-Star. Man, that guy stinks. He put him against elite talent. He can't handle his business. And he says, Shane McClanahan, never heard of that guy. Huh, he's starting? Well, let me tune in. What? You tell me this is the best the American League has? Now, granted, come on. You would like to see in a one, two, three inning where the guy wipes everybody out. It didn't happen here. But the fact of the matter that anybody would look at the all-star game and say to yourself, my goodness, McClanahan's going to take a massive hit because he gave up a few runs in an all-star game in an exhibition setting. But I, quite frankly, I do believe that there's probably voters out there that had that registered in the head. Like, hey, I'm looking for anything to move McClanahan down. But getting back to Otani here, plus 850 price here at the FanDuel Sportsbook. What does he have to do, Kevin, in the second half? Because we have to remember, he does play both sides of the coin here. He is a hitter at the plate. He is a, you know, pitcher on the mound every fifth day. He's got a prep for pitching and hitting down the stretch. So would it be any surprise if he falters a little bit on the mound? Of course it would be. And as he sits at a plus 850 price, I'm actually surprised, to be honest with you, Kevin, he's that far back. 
Because a lot of the times that we look at the betting markets, and FanDuel included, it's the flood of money that pushes those numbers around. You're trying to tell me that Shane McClanahan is getting five times the amount of money, roughly, than Shohei Otani is getting out the FanDuel Sportsbook? I don't believe it. But also, you're seeing the resurgence here of Shohei Otani. He started out the season, Kevin, not elite on the mound, an average pitcher, quite frankly, over the past, what, like, 30 to 45 days, then absolutely hit the gas pedal here. And this feels to me like every great Shohei Ostani start goes from plus 850, plus 800, plus 750, 7 to 1, where every great start from McClanahan isn't changing him, Kevin, from a 2 to 1 price down to a plus 150 to a plus 100. The market value, I think, will be chewed up quickly if Ostani continues, Kevin, to dominate on the mound. There's a couple of things there. One thing I just have to say is I really like that when you break baseball awards down, you act like the uh-huh. people voting have never heard of anybody that yes. plays in yes. small markets. Yes. Yes. Like the idea Absolutely. that anybody would have vote learned who Shane McClanahan nope. is at I'm the All Star game is so ridiculous. And you say who it all is the this time. Guy? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Like with the NFL, who is this you're guy? like, I tell you right now, man. Like Tony Gods. Now nobody out there voting knows who this guy is, but he like nope. it's just it's so ridiculous. It's so ridiculous. Yeah, but it's not so much the be- it's the betting markets though that we're talking more about the actual voters though. Like the betting <laughs> markets. Like Somebody's this. tuning on. I want to bet a Cy Young. Man, who's this McClanahan guy out here? And quite frankly, <laughs> there's probably a voter or two out there that go, Who does McClanahan play for again? Oh, that's right. No, He's a Ray. That doesn't exist, yeah. man. That doesn't and there's nobody. There's nobody at the midway point looking Craig at Mitch the AL Cy Young that. race. He'll back me up. Like, let, you know, he, no, he yes, won't. He and he won't like your, yes, your Sandy A takes either. I'll <laughs> tell you that right now. However, you did make what I thought was a really good point on Otani. You know, for years, they made sure not to give LeBron unanimous MVP because the voters were a bunch of haters who should have had their voting rights taken from him right away. But they love mm. Steph Curry, so he gets the unanimous MVP. They love Otani. And I'm not saying they shouldn't love Otani, but they love Otani. And I think, Nani, they would actually love the chance to give him both awards and be a part of history Mm. in that way. So it is one of those things where I don't think he has to be comfortably better than McClanahan to take it off of him. I will, though, say... If he gets a boost in the Cy Young market because he also hits, I'm going to lose in my mind. That does not matter. That does not matter one bit. Like, remember when Jacob DeGrom was, like, multiple times looked like the best hitter on the Mets? That was never a part of the conversation when we were talking about what was going down with the Cy Young race. I do not care that Otani can swing the bat better than McClanahan when we're talking about Cy Young races. Here is the other thing, though. McClanahan's plus 200 number is not just there because Otani has juice, but it's right next to Verlander, right? Like all these all these yeah. markets that we've gone down, this is the second closest one so far we've talked about uh, compared to then the Judge Otani race. You go through numbers there, different things. What do you think about Justin Verlander? Please do not tell me Verlander is plus it's 250 it. because everybody knows who he is. Do not, do not tell me it's that it. Verlander is I'm plus 250 because he's been around for so long. I'm telling you, look, some people might throw a vote in there, but for Jason Verlander, and that was the one vote that cost him because somebody wrote in Jason Verlander instead of Justin Verlander. But if we're looking from an AL Cy Young perspective here, star power is up there, Kevin. Like, we talk about the NL, right? You say, okay, Alcantara, Corbin Burns, Joe Musgrove, Max Fried, Tony Gonsolin. You say, oh, all right, good pitchers. But take a look at this. You know, Verlander, Otani, Garrett Cole. You know, Gaussman's even like Alec Manoa might be taking a step up here with his, hey, mic'd up performance at the All-Star game, which is quite frankly pretty fun to watch at this point. But if we're looking at Verlander, like to me, he has been maybe the best he's ever been in his career as he's approaching 40 right now. And also, do you get a bump here from the Astros who might chase down the New York Yankees? And the reason I bring that up is the same way I talked about Max Scherzer and how he gets himself back into the race. Well, Verlander is right in the thick of the race. Let's just say coming down the stretch, it's Garrett Cole versus Justin Verlander. Verlander over the final two weeks of the season, big time performances in big time games that gives his team a either the division, which it looks like they're going to run away with it, or more importantly, the American League top overall seeding. 
Are we going to get those big performances out of Shane McClanahan down the stretch where maybe he goes toe-to-toe with a Garrett Cole in September to get them back into the racer, back into the good graces of making it into the wild card? That's what I'm interested to look at. But I do feel like Justin Verlander, that plus 250, Boy, he's really priced that we think he can win it. But it just seems like he's on that back end where I don't know if he can hold this up throughout the season. But my goodness, he's only 50 cents back of McClanahan right now. A couple good starts. He could push that envelope and be the favorite here. The raw numbers on Verlander are good, right? He he is the closest to ERA. If you're going to go old school and wins matter, he's got a great chance to lead all of baseball in wins as well. Verlander obviously is a guy that people are really, I think, also, we talk about the willingness to vote for Otani. I think Verlander might be a guy that they talk about as a good story as well, coming back from the injury there to be as dominant as he has been for those Houston Astros. And speaking of the Astros, they are in action today against the New York Yankees for a doubleheader. As we give you a quick look here at what is in action today, that first game right now booked on the FanDuel Sportsbook in Houston, a doubleheader. Christian Javier, minus 120 versus TBD for the New York Yankees. We don't have a pitcher yet. I got to tell you, we don't even have odds up for game number two. I'm surprised yeah. that they're willingly posting a Yankees-Astros game without the Yankees' available starter. Yes, and here's the point about here, coming back to and I love the fact, because coming into the week, Kevin, I actually didn't think there was any Major League Baseball games here on a Thursday. I thought they all waited till Friday. So I love the fact that, you know, even when we're on this afternoon, uh, check us out on Moneyline, one o'clock, two 1 o'clock games actually teeing off, which would be the Yankees and also the Texas Rangers and the Miami Marlins. But here's what I wanted to talk about more than the actual games themselves, Kevin. You know, being a longtime handicapper, there were two spots in Major League Baseball that I really worried about. That was the game before the All-Star break, Kevin, and the game afterwards. Mm. Let's also keep in mind, the majority of these players really look forward to the All-Star break because it is a long grind. You show up at what, you know, down at training camp or should I say spring training down in, let's just say, February. You go February, March, April, May, and July, basically without a day off where you're grinding, where all of these players look forward to getting three, four, or five days home with their families or in Las Vegas or a Caribbean island. And as I say that, do you really think the breakaway is, hey, guys, you know, get away from the game, have some fun, drink some beers, hang out with your friends? That's typically what they're going to do. Very rarely is it, hey, guys, I'm going to fly back on our Sunday game to our home city on Monday, get in the cages Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and play again on Friday, and also with the starting pitching and the bullpen guys as well. Now, the starters may be a little bit different because you can't just say, I'm not going to do any work here over five days and reappear on the mound. And the reason I bring this up is what's the mindset of these players coming back? A little bit fat and happy, refreshed, ah, time to get back to work. Sometimes you don't get the best overall performances. And quite frankly, that's why the Yankees don't know who the starting pitchers will be today. Or maybe they're looking to see who's involved, who's in shape, who had a good workout, what should we do? So the betting prowess Mm -hmm. of these games is much harder to hit until you get back and also from a team total perspective guy such as myself, when you're taking a look at these breaks that they have, Kevin, Typically, your rotation restarts itself, right? You're going to put your best foot forward for the second half of the season. Your number one is going to go today. Your number two is going to go on a a, uh, Friday. Your number three on a Saturday, when normally you like those matchups where number four versus number four versus number three versus number three, that might not happen. So just a word to the wise and some caution. Again, these guys are getting back to it in a doubleheader today. Like this is a Yankees-Astros series, which might be one of the most important in Major League Baseball. Mm -hmm. And we're not sure, Kevin, who's going to start and what the lineup will actually be yeah I gotta say I don't particularly love that for what it, and, that, and that's yeah. not like oh the Yankees are at a disadvantage I mean just for baseball correct yeah you know what I mean like you wouldn't you you wouldn't do a Warriors Celtics game first game after the all-star break right like that's very unlikely I feel just kind of I don't know especially before everybody else running out the double header there that's one of the interesting things with this board here six games On the entire slate, four of them belong to a doubleheader equation. And again, we just don't have 100% guaranteed starting pitching throughout. We don't have the Dodgers starting pitcher tonight to go up against Rodon. So it's a lot of interesting stuff. But I think what you gave us there, Donnie, is really a great breakdown that captures the entire slate. Here's what I'll offer people as well. On Moneyline today, we will be live for two of these games. 
Miami Marlins up against the Rangers and that first Yankees Astros game over two hours. It's a really good chance that Donnie and I can go in play sports tonight style and perhaps find you some value live. So make sure you're tuned into the radio side, Sirius XM, channel 159, 1 p.m. Eastern start time. And it really allows me then to sneak in something I wanted to here a boost on the FanDuel sports book. It says it comes off at 3 o'clock. It's definitely going to come off before that because when the Yankees and the Astros uh, doubleheader starts. I'm almost positive of it, honestly. Yankees. Astros, Dodgers, mm. Mets, each to 100 plus games, four to one. Here is my initial thought, Donnie. Yesterday, you and I both think Yankees and Dodgers get over 100. The Astros yes, and do. the Mets, to get 100 plus wins, I don't think would be four to one. Also, the Astros over under is 101 and a half, and the Mets is 98 and a half. You're not four off the marker, and one of them is above that number as is. Man, I know it's a four leg parlay of a lot of victories. But I don't think that's a bad move there, 4-1 to one on FanDuel. It's not a bad move. Now, if I were to ask you this question here, Kevin, Yankees, Astros, Dodgers, and Mets, to you, which one is the most likely to trip you up? Because I have a number, or I have a team that I think trips you up here. Who do you think that is? It has to be the Mets, right, with the lowest projected win yes, total? Yes, correct. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. But not yeah, only I, not even I, because of the lowest projected win total, but just heading down the stretch. Braves, Phillies, you still got to deal with like the Marlins. You know, we don't know when Jacob DeGrom is actually coming back. A lot more question marks on the Mets and outside. I feel confident the other three teams do hit the one. So basically, it's a one-off for us, right, on the Mets? What? While I hear you on that, what's interesting is actually of that group, the Mets have maybe the easiest schedule remaining right there kind of with oh. the Astros in that perspective, which is a little bit maybe of an added boost. Again, plus 400 there. A lot of wins, but it's not a bad look. Don, he'll close it out. Make sure you listen up. Sports today. The Baltimore Orioles take uh, Jackson Holiday, who is a shortstop. And according to Keith Law from the Athletic, he was basically one of the guys who did the, uh, you know, improved his draft stock the most over the last 12 months. He uh, essentially he got into the gym, reworked his body so that uh, he kind of went from more of a, a contact, even swing plane type pitch to or a hitter to a, like a power hitter. The Sports Grid Network. Sports Grid, your 24 7 sports wagering network. They play less games. The early line. Take a look at the top four seeds here in the Big Ten. They're going to play Aaron less. Rogers and the morning the after. Wilson. We saw movement in the marketplace like Orlando. Fantasy Magic. Sports the today. The Cavaliers are a little thin as well. Newswire. Minus 160 favorite on the money line today for Arizona. Pharrell, coast to coast. That's where they win cups. Stanley comes over there. Give me the game pass. time decision. Kind of bizarre when you consider like the, everybody is out for the Warriors. In game live all like access. Vandy. I like Vandy against Bam. I think Vandy can win the game, take a corner. In half. game oh, live win. prime oh, yeah, time. The major, the PGA champion. In yes. game live overtime. All done before the final bet. Get the game. winning edge only on Sports Grid. The morning after that it means more for the league where it always just means more to add Texas and Oklahoma than the Big Ten adding USC and UCLA. Texas comes in with its own network uh, that has mm. its own set of advertisers and money and everything else that they'll fold into the SEC. I know you as a perennial uh, college football playoff team contender. Will they be that in the SEC? No, but they are a team that brings that sort of prestige with them. The Sports Grid Network. Pharrell, coast to coast. What he has done, Scott, is just, it's old school, man. I mean, a guy that when he throws, if I'm a relief pitcher, I'm like, all right, I got the night off, I guess, because he's not going to let me come into the game. Uh, he's just going to basically tell Magley, like, sit your ass down in the dugout. I'm going to finish this game because I can't trust the bullpen. The guy is eight, nine innings, 100, 105, 110, 115. The Sports Grid Network. The early line. This actually was a positive sign from the Lakers because at least these guys are talking, trying to repair that relationship. And also, it doesn't hurt that they finally put out a positive leak 
on the Lakers side of this because nonstop negativity has been the tone as it pertains to Russ and L.A. Only on Sports Grid. All right, right back at it here for the last segment of the day for the early line. Sirius XM Channel 159 right here on the Sports Grid Network. Both myself, Donnie Wrightside, and Kevin Walsh, as always, carrying you through from 7 to 9 a.m. Before we hand it over to Ben Stevens and the morning after to get the rest of your grid on for the rest of the day. But I got to tell you something. There's a lot of things changing in the college football environment here. We don't know who's in conference, which conference here or there, day to day, and what's going to take place even over the next 30 days, let alone over the next 30 years. But something happened yesterday that I am not happy with, and I preface this by saying I am a Miami Hurricanes fan. Listen up. When I got word of this happening, I was quite frankly shocked because one of my you know, fun parts about watching college football, for me being a Miami Hurricane fan, was the turnover chain. It was innovative. It was awesome. It was brash. It was bravado. It was exciting. And in big games, which Miami quite frankly didn't play a ton of big games over the past five years, but when they did have one, when there was a turnover, it was must see TV to see that Hurricane player run over to the bench, stand up, open up a chest, bring out a giant chain, and put it around their neck and celebrate the turnover in front of all the fans. It took the nation by storm. So now, a Brett McMurphy tweet yesterday comes out, Miami dumping the turnover chain. Mary Cristobal said the Canes are getting rid of the chain because it's not part of their culture. This is the Miami culture. Brash, bravado, the 80s, the 90s, the 2001 team that won the national championship, the 2002 team that won the national championship. Yes, they got robbed by Ohio State. But everybody loved this. Everybody emulated. Everybody tried to copy what they're going to do for a turnover or a touchdown here. Miami was at the forefront of something fantastic. And Mario Cristobal has been doing wonderful things at the U. But this is his first slip up right here. The turnover chain needs to be reinstated, and I want to help do it here. Is what it is. Bring it back, Mario. Say it ain't so. Stay tuned for Ben right now on the grid, waiting for the rest of the day. Bring it back! 